What's up, Backgammon fans? Mark Olsen here. Welcome to the Backgammon Podcast, episode two. In this episode, we have a special guest. He's a grandmaster. He's been a grandmaster even before we had the notion of grandmasters in Backgammon. He's been at the top of the game through the 80s, the 90s, and even to this day. Uh, it's Will Snellings. A lot of you guys know him already, so I'm really looking forward to, to pick his brains and uh, to talk about Backgammon. Uh, yeah, so let's get started. Mr. Will Snellings, welcome to the podcast. Nice to meet you. Hey, Mark. That, thanks very much for having me. I, I Hopefully I can follow up uh, decently on the great interview with Bob Wachtel. I enjoyed that a lot. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, it's got a lot of views already on YouTube. So I think there's a, a thirst for for this thing that we're doing here, Backgammon Podcast. And, uh, yeah, the I- absolutely. Mm-hmm. The idea is that I'm going to have some great players in the, in the podcast. We're going to talk about Backgammon and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the guest, which in this case is you. And then in the end, I'm going to show you a little bit of backgammon positions just to test out and uh, try to pick your brains on, on how you think about the game. Is that okay? Yeah, so- sounds good. I like the torture at the end. Okay. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about, actually why I wanted to have you on right now is that uh, there's something going on right now which is quite, quite amazing. And uh, that's your winning streak on backgammon galaxy. As far as my intel tells me, you are up to 19 wins in a row and you've been averaging about 2.6 in PR. So could you tell us a little bit about this win streak? And it's still ongoing, right? Yes, I have another match after I finish this interview, so we'll see how that goes. But I'm, I'm glad to say that yeah, the streak is intact. It's been, uh, you know, it's a crazy ride. I mean, if, if I was in my 20s or 30s, I'd probably be just, you know, like celebrating all this time. I'm pretty cool about it, but I'm really enjoying it. There's, you know, there's no, no getting around that. Yes. And, and it, 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 part, part of it is that I've been challenging some of the best players. So I'm not just you know cleaning up against players that are not quite at my level. I'm, I'm playing some pretty tough opponents. I think they've averaged around 3-0 or 3-1 against me during this period. So that's crazy. It's just it, crazy. It's, it, it is. It's insanely lucky, and you know obviously the skill differential is is there, but it's very slight. Mm-hmm. Who are the players you've been playing against? I've played out of that batch. I think twelve of the matches have been against uh, Hideki Uda, uh, the the winner of your UBC challenge in Gibraltar this year. And and Uda's been a good sport, but I just he's been you know part of this streak on the wrong side. And I think that accounts for maybe twelve of the nineteen matches. I think are against him, and then a couple against uh, Tony Bernaba, obviously a terrific player out of Lebanon. Um, two against uh, a, a ref. I, I forget which a ref is which on your yeah. list. Yeah, so Alipur. That just the one that says a ref, right? Yeah, there's, actually, there's another yeah. one. So ref seven seven seven. That's I also him. Sure. That's also. Oh, him. okay, good. Yeah. All right. I, We're I not really allowing uh, multiple accounts, but somehow he slipped through the cracks. He happens to have one. Yeah, so two are against him. One was against uh, John O'Hagan, and I'm not sure if that's it. Anyhow. It is what it is. It's crazy. Yeah. And uh, I'm just going to show the viewers a little something here. Let me just transition to to this screen. And I'm just going to show them the current rankings on, on Backgammon and Galaxy. Uh, we've got you at number three, Will. And you are, I think, just in, in the exclusive company of you and four other players to have ever crossed 3,000 in, in Galaxy rating. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, your galaxy rating so you actually you, you you do play a lot online these days it seems since you can have this this high of a rating uh, is that something you do a lot play online these days well I don't I'm in Costa Rica and really other than playing with my son occasionally I just I don't have the opportunity to play live during the this pandemic uh, year that we're having but last year I did I did go out and uh, I went to Michigan with the intention of playing in their July tournament and then got very sick no no pandemic stuff but 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 it was pretty pretty bad so I played very limited there but then I went to Monte Carlo got to meet you lucky enough to finish in the round of eight in, in the main and and that was it that was my first event first you know active event in 22 years at that point 
Wow. And I do look forward, you know, you and I tried to see if we could coordinate somehow my making it to the UBC, depending upon where and when it was going to be this year. And that just didn't, didn't pan out. But, you know, next year we'll see how everything, hopefully with the vaccines coming online, there'll be an opportunity in the, in the late summer or early fall. And I hope to play in, you know, at least three tournaments a year um, until I retire. So that that's, that's a big element that you know, some people aren't aware that, that my schedule just doesn't allow for traveling or, you know, I don't live in the States or in Europe where I could just come for a weekend tournament. It's not, not that easy. Yeah. Okay. Because I think the UBC format would be really interesting to see how you would fare in this, in this tournament. Obviously, you know, the, the format for the viewers who don't know it, it's a, it's a tournament that Backgammon Galaxy uh, set up in 2019. Mochi was the champion the first year and in 20, 2020, uh, Hideaki Ueda, whom I've been playing against Will in this uh, streak of his, he won the contender tournament and actually he played a 2.7 PR average of, a, I think it was 17 matches. Uh, seven point matches so he won the tournament the format is that you get one point every time you win a match and one point for a pr win as well so it's really really skill heavy of course there's some luck as well uh, uh the best player in the tournament PR, pr wise was thomas christensen he averaged 2.3 which was astonishing obviously uh and then we had uh, i think michi and uh, we either was around 2.7 um shiman was around 2.8 i think and so really really high level of backgammon so it would be a pleasure to see you one day uh playing in the ubc will yeah I, I look for i'm going to do it one day for sure just as soon as possible cool and um what is it about your life that uh and, and backgammon you know because maybe we can go a little bit into your your biography here because you've been one of those players that has been at the top for several decades except there was a gap that's actually when I started playing backgammon. I, I haven't even heard of you. And then all of a sudden you mm -hmm. started playing again and it's like, who's this guy? And oh, you don't know this guy. He used to be the best of the world, basically. Um, so, so could you tell us a little bit about your backgammon story? Yeah, there, there was a cryogenic period. So I, I reemerged. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to keep it yeah, sort of like chronological, but not, not getting stuck on things that people wouldn't care too much about. The, the, the first time I played back in when I think it was about 15. So my, my stepfather's family played a lot of different board games, uh, cribbage and you know, different card games, di different other uh, card games. And back in was one of them. A and I don't recall my exact feeling at the beginning, but I do remember I was I, being drawn toward that board, the, the aesthetics of it, uh, the dice component, and I, I was practicing, not practicing, but just playing at the beginning against uh, my stepfather's father, who played you know, for a long time. And he clearly was a smart guy and sort of taught me a little bit of the logic of some things. And I was drawn in by that too. But I didn't, you know, didn't play again until it was like a, a year went by. And now my first girlfriend is really hot girl named if she's out there somewhere amber brookman i remember her name well and i remember her her name and is brookman it's almost like me brockman exactly was it right w double o or single o double o okay, uh, double okay. o k m a n just one n <laughs> and uh amber and i went to a party with uh, some friends and and it was uh, there was a back end one is inlaid nice inlaid back end uh, boards there and Amber apparently knew how to play like quite well. I think someone in her family had, had taught her. So now I have my really hot girlfriend playing backgammon. I know a little bit. I'm playing against her and she's clearly better than me. But I'm sort of hypnotized by her and the board and wanting to get better at this game. The whole the whole energy was really wild. So our relationship ended like four months later and my relationship with backgammon has gone on for another 45 years. Okay. Yeah, that was that was it was kind of a key moment because that triggered my interest to I found a lot of sort of crappy books that were available at the time. I didn't find McGreal's book until much later. And I was there'd be quiz books and, and I went through these and tried to understand the, the logic behind behind the uh, supposedly correct plays. Probably a third of the answers were wrong, but you know, who knew, right? And, and, and at some point the, you must have been introduced to, to some sort of competition or money game scene or how did that happen? Yeah, so I went from from there, I did 
somehow a little investigating and found out where back end when it was, was played in New York. I think in the background, I knew that my cousin of my stepfather's, who's about eight years older than me, was playing at, at the time, he was playing at the Mayfair Club, which was the biggest club in New York and pretty famous because most of the stars from New York uh, emerged uh, from that scene. And my cousin played there and he had been a chess player. And a after a few years, he became good friends with Paul McGreal and he became, according to him, and according to a couple of those people too, perhaps the best money player in New York. He never traveled to tournaments and you know he was pretty low profile, but you get him in the, the, the back room where they play the high stakes game. Cool. And, and he, he was the guy back then. Um, so I'd heard about this. I, I never played backgammon with my cousin, but anyhow, this was in, you know, this something that was feeding me in, in my, my developing addiction for this, um, for the game. Yeah. Okay. So I started hanging out at a couple of the, not so much the Mayfair. I went there a couple of times, but the stakes were higher. The fees were higher. I went to some of these divey places in New York where, you know, a, a few of the really good players would come there at odd odd times of the night you know drinking or on drugs or whatever and but you get to watch a lot of talent and you can play for a dollar or two two dollars a point so that's how i started to get you know a feel for taking risk in the game and also learning just by watching a lot of really good players who were the good best players in those times in new york well i mean mcgreal was already you know already a legend and and kind of notorious, I didn't realize it at the time, but notorious for being you know, a great match player, a great teacher, and not terribly disciplined where it came to, to money games. But if he got the right opponent, he could you know, he could destroy people, of course. But there were other players, Chuck Papazian played back then, um, Billy Haran, Eric Seidel had just shown up, I think Eric's like one year older than me, and he was very, very good immediately. Um, so who else? Uh, Jason Lester, my, you know, Mike Sankowitz. It was quite a crowd of, you know, of legends of that period. And many of these players either retired or, you know, a few of them have, have kept playing, but it, it's tough to keep up with the bots. It depends on your energy and a lot of things. Yeah, it must have been completely different times. Uh, what are we talking about here? Are we talking late 70s, early 80s or? Yeah, so, right. I'm. Born in '59, so I started playing in these clubs so I th when I was 17. So that would have been in '76 is when I first showed up in any club. You're 17. Were you already gambling at that time? I, I started gambling when I was, and I'm not saying hardcore or anything. I came from a pretty traditional kind of preppy, very educated family, but I was drawn to gambling. I think part of it was my, my father was a very good uh, gin rummy player, and. He and I didn't see each other a lot because there was a divorce by the time I was four. But I kind of knew that he was this really good gambler on top of being a lawyer. And so it was either that or just some random thing where you just take up an interest in something. Yeah. And I, and I made I made a bet, I remember, on this famous Super Bowl in, in 1971 or two, where the Jets from New York were playing Baltimore. And conferences, there were different leagues at that point. And the Jets were a huge underdog. And, and I hustled my mother by betting her a dollar. And I bet on Baltimore. It was favored by like 13 points, which I knew from the New York Post. I mean, kids aren't usually like leading odds in the favor at age 12. But anyhow, so I had a huge advantage, but lost. And and I did pay her the dollar, but I felt really, really bad about that. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to win when you have big advantages. So that's that's kind of how it started. And then I would play like a little bit of poker with with some friends by like 13, 14 years old. And it just kind of progressed from there. OK, I was actually I'll just say one thing. Mm -hmm. I, I was actually the, the class bookmaker when I was <laughs> I think I was 15. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure it was either 15 or 16. And I was taking bets. But the way people could bet, I wasn't taking vigorish, but I had a, a hidden way to get vigorish. So, I would post lines that were slightly inaccurate. You know, I'd take the New York Post or whatever, and I'd post different numbers. And you could only bet one side of it. I'd say, you know, if you want Dallas is playing Washington, the real line is Dallas minus three. But I'd make the line Dallas minus four and a half and say, you know, if, if you want to take Dallas, you can lay four and a half. Otherwise, you know, we don't have a bet. And, and I was getting like a lot of, you know, a lot of action when you're 16 years old and it's in the 70s is, you know, like $150 a weekend or something. 
Wow. But finally, the the not the principal of the school, but his the number number two guy sort of found out about this, you know, and they were trying to find my book. I had a literal book with all the weeks in it. And, but I, someone told me they were looking for me, so I hid the book, and brought it into the headmaster's office at some point, and, and he just said, look, Snellings, you know, this is like, fine, we haven't found evidence, but, you know, we're, we're on to you, and please just, like, stop it. And he, he kind of at that point turned to me and said, you know, you're either going to be a riverboat gambler or you're going to be, like, a major politician. I don't know which, but you figure it out. So that was my that was my bookmaker story. Yeah, wow, what a what a great education to get into backgammon, be, be, being a bookmaker at age fifteen. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what happened then? Now you're seventeen years old. You're starting to hang out in the clubs. You've seen some talent. You observe how they play. What then? I ended up going to uh, University of Virginia, which is a pretty good school, and. Um, one of the, and I wanted to keep playing backgammon, and then fortunately backgammon was, you know, all over the place during those years. That was the late 70s, early 80s was big for backgammon. People were taking boards to the beach, and, um, and you know, several of the people in, in my uh, dorm hall were, were playing. So we did some of that, and I found one guy in an in a adjacent dorm from Long Island, and this guy had played at some clubs in Long Island, and it was clearly like far ahead of me. I had come a you know, decent, decent distance in a short period of time, but this guy was better. So I decided, yeah, he and I would play, but I made a deal with him after I realized he was better. I said, you just have to answer one question per game. And, and, and you know, I'm going to know if you're bullshitting me. So you just have to answer one question a game. That's it. So we were playing for three dollars a point. At the beginning, he was, he was up some, but, but I went on. It's like this crazy run now that I'm on in matches. I went on some streak where I won like 31 out of 33 games and, and he quit me. This is after he'd been answering questions for like two months. And clearly that was just really lucky, but this guy was all about edge too. So he and I ended up, we didn't play any more backgammon, but we ended up forming like a, a bookmaking partnership. And we started giving out those parlay cards uh, to, to a lot of the students. And we did that for like a football season. Okay. <laughs> And okay, so I mean, you're, you're quite industrious in this, uh, both in terms of your game playing and the laying of odds, becoming yeah, an underground bookmaker, essentially. Were you able to keep up with your studies? Did you eventually take your degree or, or what, kind, what happened there? Yeah, so, so my GPA while I was there, I think, well, it was three, five until my last semester. So I, so I was there for three years. I was kind of partially incomplete in, in my final semester. And it was becoming an increasing distraction because I, I had actually found some older guys who used to go to the, the university where you know, like one guy was 30, another guy was like 45, and we were playing back in and Chouettes, and it's just more and more my attention. I started to take some road trips to Washington, D.C., where I met for the first time Kent Goulding and Kip Woolsey. There was a Chouette there. And, and, and there's some downside to these stories. I, I won't go into great detail. But, but I had a, a degenerate gambling aspect to my personality at that point, which it's not like, oh, I'm not proud of it. It was just who I was at the time. So there were a few instances and this one in Washington, D.C., where I ended up stiffing this guy. I wrote him a bad check for $2,000. There's a background story to this. I won't go into details, but again, I'm not proud of it. You know, Just because I met those guys doesn't mean that they had any regard for me at that point. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think you still have that side of your personality or have you integrated it and dealt with it? Uh, I, I rooted that out almost completely by the time I was 30. I mean, it did take me some time to get really get rid of it. And almost nothing had to do with back. I mean, that instance was just betting you know, more than my capital. It wasn't steaming or anything. I almost never steamed in back. I mean, I'm not going to say that I never had a session or a moment or anything. But my problem with sports betting. Ironically, because now I run, you know, the NBA department for one of the one of the biggest international sports books. But that's how much I cleaned up my act and you know, mm -hmm. and and became respectable enough that someone would give me a position. Like that. <laughs> how, how did you do that? Did it come through improving your skill level, or was it working with your own psychology, or what was the process you went through? My own psychology, for for sure. I, so, some some was uh, learning from some of the best. I worked for a group that was uh, that was moving bets for some of the 
Sharp is better than in the U.S. I did that for three years uh, in, in somewhere in the 90s. And so just figuring out, trying to, um, you know, sort of uh, reverse engineer what their process, I, you know, they weren't telling me why they were making bets, but I was trying to figure it out, especially in the NBA, because that I, that I knew. Um, but beyond that, it was definitely working on my psychology. And I, I did this with psychologists to some extent. I did this through introspection. It was a combination of a lot of things, but I, you know, and also when I started to have a family, I, I knew, look, I really got to get this together because you know, I want this family. I love this woman. I love these kids. And, and if I don't have this together, it's not going to last. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, okay, let's jump back to your backgammon path. So now we are in the, I guess, start to mid 80s. You are kind of coming out of college. Uh, so what happened then? Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I left. I left Virginia after after virtually uh, three years, m much to my family's like you know disgust, disturbance, whatever. Um, again, because almost everyone in my family had extra degrees and super academic in their orientation, and, and I was too. But I had this this obviously this backgammon and gambling bug that was just you know, luring me away. And I'm not the only one. I remember I hear, heard Jason Lester left Cornell after two or three years. I'm sure there are many others um, who are you know, go, going through the same thing because your regular studies, I mean, I was studying philosophy and English literature and and fine, you know, they, they gave me some some juice, but in a very different way and, and very low key adrenaline. And, and this, the, the I wasn't doing drugs or anything else, but this was my drug. Yeah, sure. okay. So, so you left the, you left the college, and, and did you get into a gambling career already then? And was backgammon, or was it more sports betting? And how did backgammon then? Because the list that I'm gonna talk about in the, in the next section here, uh, we see some incredible PRs from you from your old games. So I want kind of want to know what happened there from the mid '80s to up to the mid '90s, uh, backgammon wise. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll speed it up. We've kind of got a, a, a capsule of some of the ingredients uh, going in. So, yeah, so I, I, I leave college. I went uh, to the West Coast for a little bit. I played a little bit in L.A. Um, I think I was in Sacramento uh, briefly. I ended up in, in Vegas, and in Vegas I was playing some poker and playing a little bit of backgammon. But if you, you kind of skip some steps here, I got married when I was – 22 and I went I went straight for a, a little bit so this is very brief but go, going straight was I was looking for maybe I can get something as an assistant or trainee to be a stockbroker that was one angle I ended up working it for a, a color tile company um, in somewhere in Los Angeles for like three months where no one can picture this everyone thinks for sure I'm inventing this but I was selling tile to you know people who were wanting to improve prove their homes and uh, yeah that was a very strange experience but anyway yeah I learned a little bit of something I suppose and uh, we ended up moving back to the east coast I uh, went up to Philadelphia there was someone who knew me from back and when, when I I played in Atlanta briefly and this guy knew me and took me under his wing a bit and said, you really, you know, you should trade options on the Philadelphia Stock Exchange because that's what he had done. He moved up there. And so I got training doing that. And I traded options in Philadelphia from age 24 to 29. So th this was 1983 to 1988. And I was playing some backgammon because the, um, the apartment uh, complex that we lived in had a backgammon club in in uh, on the first floor which i knew about it's not like a coincidence i mean that was intentional to, to live there so that part of the way i was making some money and keeping my interest in backgammon was was playing at this club and there were some very good players there the most notable of anyone that you know this audience would remember well there are two people really howard ring uh who i'd met in florida before and, and howard um you know is, was just a powerhouse player i think someone commented this morning and in, in a in your Facebook post about a question about Howard Rang, how good was he? When was he, you know, mm -hmm. top of the list? And Howard, you know, by all rights, if he wasn't, if he didn't get into the option trading game in a very, very serious way, he would have been, you know, in the top five, at, at worst ten for many years. He was a terrific player, a great guy for those who knew Howard at all, and died way too young of, of Parkinson's disease. 
Of what? Of Crohn's disease. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. it and, takes you from yeah. very quickly. He'd had it for a long time, but it finally just just took him down. It's very hard to survive uh, late late in life. Okay, uh, was was um, he older than you? Howard and I were almost exactly the same age. I'm not. We might okay. have differed by a year or something. And Mary Hickey was also playing. Um, and, you know, Mary's written books, and, and Mary's a terrific player in her own right. And and Mary was there, and, and Dan Harrington was there, who's not only went on to become you know one of the legends of poker, but he was also a terrific backgammon player. Yeah. So those those are the kind of people I interacted with uh, at, at the club. And, and kept my game going. So finally, the crash of 87 comes in the stock market and I'm on the trading floor and the company that I work for, it, it was actually the lead guy had been a backgammon player named Chris Peterson from, uh, from Boston. And Chris and his brother, you know, it could have happened in different ways, but they happened to wipe out their own company uh, through uh, the volatility just, just crushed them. In my own positions, I made 100000 but given that the company was out of business, that was worthless. And it was random that I made money also. I don't take no credit for that. The company went belly up, and fortunately, there was like a small pension thing, and so I got a little cash out of the situation. And now I decided, all right, you know, what's my next move? I can get on with another trading group, or I can maybe play backgammon for a while. And I did a little bit of both, but I started migrating to New York. Philly and New York are very close. It's like two hours away. And I showed up at the Coterie and began. That was when my backgammon level moved from who knows where I was. Let's say maybe I was the 20th best player when I arrived at the, at the Coterie. And after three, three years or so, you know, I got to the level that, uh, you know, I, I was probably the best by maybe 91 or 92 something like that. And then this, this list didn't come out, the first list that they didn't, didn't come out until 93. But that was hard work. I mean, the Coterie, first of all, the fees were really high. The players that, you know, migrated in and out of there, I mean, you know, Sabadney held court uh, there. He wasn't playing all the time, but he was always like around and trying to get people to come in to play. And um, again, we have, you know, Haran and Sankowitz and, um, and Jason Lester and uh, Chuck Papagian was there uh, to some extent. I'm probably gonna miss this, and Bob Wachtel, you know, o over time he would come in. Paul McGreal was there. Um, that's pretty, Joe Sylvester at some point came through. Joe, Joe and I were pretty good friends, but back at that time, and Joe was, you know, perhaps the best match player. Certainly his results were tremendous in the work he did with Matt. It was, was great, it was, you know, groundbreaking in, in some ways with some match equity understandings. Mm -hmm. Joe is a little bit like McGreal though. His his uh, ability to play, keep his wits about him while playing for money was sort of, was not good. Um, okay. But anyhow, yeah, that's the cast. And, and, and what I did in order to improve, again, I'm playing with these guys. Sometimes it's a head to head game, but you still get to watch. And, and, and I became kind of accepted. It took a little while to the point where you could actually like share ideas and you know just sit around talking about the game in general with, with, with some of these guys but i was also this is the period the biggest period where i started to do a lot of rollouts so i would finish playing and it, this is there was a there was a window where I, I wasn't married before getting married again so i had a lot of extra free time and i would be at the club for they opened at like one o'clock in the afternoon so it was like one to ten let's say and then I would go back to my parents' apartment or wherever I was and just start rolling out some key position or two from, from the day. Just doing hand um, rollouts. Just doing hand rollouts. And, and the way I did it pretty quickly, I wasn't playing all these games to conclusion because people who imagine all these rollouts, it's like, wow, it's just like so tedious. And I mean, especially now with the bots, it sounds like, you know, insanity, right? But, but what I would do is I would try to, try to, after three or four rolls deep, try to make some estimation of what I thought the position was worth then, mm -hmm. record that, and then start a, you know, start the rollout. So a truncation point. Same position again. Yeah, these truncated rollouts were, were helpful. After a couple of years, I, I became friends with Walter Trice, who everyone knows with his great formulas and, and a lot of terrific writing on the subject of backgammon, especially from a mathematical perspective. And so Walter and I became friends, and Walter 
Um, I, I paid Walter a little bit for some projects, some rollouts and some different things I, you know, I wanted to have done that I just didn't have time for. But Walter came up with a program for me, which was not a bot, but the program, you know, like some people heard about this and they meant, oh, Will like had a bot before anyone had a bot. But what, what the program did, it was very efficient for me and improved my ability to roll things out by about six times. That was what I estimated the speed was. I had a random dice generator and you know the board would keep popping up. You just hit a button and it would reset whatever position you had. It mm -hmm. would record the results. And again, I was doing this, these truncated estimates. Nice. Okay, Looking so back, I think my truncated estimates might have been better than anybody else's truncated estimates, but I don't think they were that great. So I came up with some conclusions that were probably either just blatantly wrong or yeah. quite imperfect. Yeah. I mean, truncation points uh, is, is really an effective idea. In game theory, you have this way of solving a game that's called backwards, into, backwards induction. So you basically solve a game by starting from the end of the game. And in, in backgammon, that would be a racing position. So just by knowing the value of a racing position, you can speed up your hand rollouts quite a lot. How was yeah. the how was the knowledge just in, in terms of racing position? Was that more or less solved back then, or was even that still something of a of a mystery for most players? No, I well, I don't know about you know, the, the elite players. I had a pretty good grasp of of racing. Of okay. races. It's not as nailed down to you know to the decimal as it is now, but yeah, that that was that was pretty well known. The the, the biggest gaps. Well, the biggest what happened. You know, I'm told the story because I wasn't around for all this, but but at the Mayfair Club, again, where it's just like this brain trust was 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 operating. There was a breakthrough with one guy who I became very close to uh, later in life was Stan Thompson, and and Stan and McGreal were the cutting edge of trying to figure out um, you know what was not really well understood about the game. So they, they started, you know, the, the primes became the fashion and, and, and purity in general and uh, not being afraid to re re recycle ton, tons of men in order to play back games, especially because I did figure out that even if that wasn't necessarily optimal in the sense of if they were playing each other, that it, it would just crush all these other players who just, you know, they were on the scene, they had money, they thought back in was cool, Hefner was playing at the Playboy Mansion. And so a lot of those players couldn't play worth shit. So the best thing is just to complicate the game as much as possible. And even if the game took a while, their chances of winning the game were just negligible, especially if you factor in the queue. Mm -hmm. So that's where things were starting back then. And 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 it was didn't you know you skip all the way up to Roberti, and Roberti brought the game back in line. Now a lot of the New York players thought you know Roberti's way too extreme. He's like you know playing the game almost as a race and way too tight. But Roberti was actually closer than, than they were. It's all relative to who you're playing, who your opponents are. But if you're all elite players, Roberti's style, his approach to the game was sort of revolutionary in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a backwards way, right? It's like, well, we're going to go back to how it was being played in the 1950s. But he was very evolved. It was, it was not literally that. That's it's, so cool. It's, it's the first time I hear anyone setting, uh, putting names on, on these styles because I've read about the purists of the 70s, but I didn't know who were the trendsetters. So it was McGreal and who, who was the other one? And, and Stan Thompson. And, yeah. and Thompson is well known by the older players. You know, okay. yes, Kent yeah. and Mike St. All, all these guys. And then Roberti Kent. came and, and, and brought it a little bit back to, to a more racing and more balanced. Uh, how, how do you think Roberti came up with these ideas? Was it just by trial and error or did he have some profound uh, ideas or did, was he doing hand rollouts? It, that, that's a fair question. I, and I knew Bill a little bit, but I never asked him those questions. I, I, I can't. Bill was a terrific chess player, as as Mike Sankowitz and several of these players. And I think I don't know if it has to do with chess at all in this case. But but Bill's personality is pretty conservative, and I think that may have lent something. His own psychology may have influenced uh -huh. his feeling. And, and you know, I'm sure probably playing some of the purists um, in in matches and and feeling like. You know, just did, it seemed like it was over, being overdone, which it was. You know, he was he was onto something there, yeah. and uh, yeah, you'd have to ask Bill. Bill, yeah. Bill would be someone. We need to get him on the podcast. That's for sure. Yeah. 
um, okay, so you, you had this, now you got this computer program that was helping you doing hand rollouts. Did anyone else have access to this other than you and Walter Trice? Yeah, unless, unless Walter, you know, I mean, he might have made some deal on the side with somebody, but we had kind of an exclusive, at least for a little while. I mean, I, I think eventually he shared it with other people. I don't know what our agreement was, but, but I'm pretty sure I was the only one who had it for a couple of years. Yeah. And how did you how did you choose your uh, the positions that you were rolling out? Was it kind of like random positions that struck you during the, the last session you had, or did you have a kind of a structured way of approaching it? Like now I'm going to do holding games, and then you tried out all the different holding game cap combinations. Now I'm going to do a opening blitz and so forth. What was your process? Yeah, it would be nice if it was that methodical. It was really the, the first, you know, the okay. things that came up out of the day that were, were fresh, that I thought were interesting, that I thought if I could get a handle on this, I might really learn something. And there might be a proposition bet at the club. Uh -huh. So I had okay. that, you know, back in the days where, where there were now, of course, there are almost no propositions. But yeah, I mean, there was there were a lot of proposition. But yeah, as other people have mentioned, you know, Bob Wachtel, I think, was talking about Bob. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, th those gen and th those could go on for for quite a while and and it was you know you could get a feel while you were playing them but it was certainly was very helpful if you already had a really good idea from rolling it for out for sure yeah because there's a lot of noise in the uh, in rolling out backgammon positions by hands you need to get up to a pretty significant sample size before the truth yeah. starts to reveal itself uh okay well i'm just going to show the viewers here uh this list that we were referring to earlier on so this i'm showing the viewers a list that's been compiled by rick janowski and uh, it's a database, or it's a list of analyzed matches with Extreme Gammon. So it's the current version of Extreme Gammon, uh, analyzing a database of old matches played be up until 1995. So it's the pre-bot era. And we can see here that even though it's just a sample of eight matches, we don't, we didn't, don't have too many matches here uh, for all the players, but I guess it's what we have. And you had a PR average of four and a half, which is significantly the best PR of this entire list. I, I think we got Paul McGrill down here in the 16th uh, spot at, with 6.4. Obviously, he probably had matches which were even earlier than yours, probably. We've got uh, Roberti, six and a half, Eric Seidel, six and a half, Swobotny, a lot of these names here. But there's only one other player besides you with a PR below five, and that is Howard Ring that you just mentioned uh, just before. But but looking at these numbers, I, I find it quite astonishing. So I guess that maybe not only did you have talent for the game, but this way of working with the game, doing the hand rollouts, and maybe even the computer program was one of the primary explanations of this uh, kind of performance, or what, what would you say? Yeah, I, I I don't want to I don't want to make light of that or overstate my you know how good I was without it, but I I think um, I think it helped to some extent. I I, I don't want to overstate it. it. It was a value, and, and and players that maybe thought that they you know should have been still a lot better than me would say, oh yeah, but apparently Snellings had this whole out thing, you know, which was not a bot. I keep repeating. Um, so it, it was a blend. I, I mean, I would say it was 90% how I was to begin with and, and my studying and learning from, you know, top players. Because I had started doing this, I had started doing this when they only had these, you know, these long pages of, of printout, printout uh, you know, back end matches. I, I ordered as many as I could. There were only, they had to include at least, at least one top, like 20 player. Because I wanted to go through all these matches, and, and I did it. My method with doing that was to assume that they were making the right play. Like even if I disagree with them, I would like assume they not because I thought they clearly did, but there was a reason for this. And, and I would I would write a category of you know I'm like you know hitting loose too much, or I'm playing with too many bots, or you know I'm priming too much, or I'm forgetting whatever. I had actually a list of 120 categories. I'm pretty sure it was about that long. And I wanted to see, because what I figured was, if a category develops where I have all these checks, right, just like 50 times, then I'm sure that I'm actually doing it wrong. Like, I'm, if it only comes up a couple of times, I could be right, they could be right. But but I was wanted to focus on the ones where I was clearly you know, making a lot of mistakes compared to these top players. And that was another tool that I had. But that started a bit earlier uh, than, than this rollout stuff. 
Yeah, okay. So that's that's actually really, really interesting. So this was a way of, of kind of training your pattern recognition. It's almost like what we do now when we analyze games with the bot. You just had a, a weaker uh, bot, <laughs> which was the all the expert moves from, from the players back then. Okay, so so yeah. that I'm I'm kind of yeah. narrowing now. It's kind of seeing your 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 methods like you were. I think you were very structured, uh, given the tools that was available. The way you studied it, uh, 120 categories. That's a lot. Uh, the way I categorize uh, backgammon positions is like I have like four main categories, which is like the game plans, uh, prime blitz, uh, race, and contact. And then I kind of find uh, a category a subset of that category uh, and then it, so it's like you get into contact okay then you get into back games then you get into one three back games one four back games one five back games and so on and even there you have positions where okay do you have good timing mediocre timing or bad timing and like there's always so many different variations uh, yeah you have a tree with branches kind sure. of like a tree with branches of course then yeah. sometimes it goes outside the tree for instance like a lot of middle game positions you got uh, you don't really have a defined uh, position yet. You 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 kind of like there's still priming, blitzing, racing, contact going on, uh, and and then it's it, that that's one of the things about backgammon. It's it's not really all variables are interacting with each other all the time. It's very difficult to just uh, swap one variable, isolate isolate yeah. one variable because it's always entangling. Uh, so that makes it interesting. So sometimes it doesn't fit exactly into that tree structure. But did you have kind of a structure like this, or was it just, uh, uh, or, or how did you how did you categorize this? You said you had 120 categories. How, how were they? Yeah, I I, I didn't. I, it would have been nice. I got rid of tons of backend notes for, from that period. Like basically every backend note eventually like just dis disappeared from that period. So I would have liked to have preserved. I mean, it would look a little bit chaotic. I'll I'll say that. I mean, I was I was structured in a certain way. But the way I went about that was, um, yeah, very, very often it wouldn't be a category in the way that you're defining it. Okay. That's all I can say. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's very, it's very organic, you know, like I understood what I meant and, and, you know, I derived meaning from the way that I went about this, but you might look at it and say, gee, okay, I trust you that you benefit from this, but you know, <laughs> Another thing that I that I remember, Will, uh, we were talking, maybe it's like a year or so ago. We've known each other now for a couple of years, mostly online. We, we did get to meet each other last year at the Monte Carlo World Championship. And we did the, the commentary together for the, the final. And for the viewers who haven't seen that, I, I really recommend that you go in and see that final between Petco and uh, our Israeli friend, um, Eli Roymi. Um, super interesting match. I, I think it's got more than 50,000 views now on YouTube, by the way, this wow. uh, this final. Uh, but I don't remember if it was there or another time where we were talking about a backgammon position and I was kind of like searching for a uh, a way of like a like a human term. For instance, like uh, Grandmaster Michi from Japan. He has a lot of colorful expressions to, to recognize patterns in backgammon. And you're like, ah, what, what? we don't need that. I, I don't really like it too much. So I kind of noticed that, that maybe you, you, the way you see the game is more fluid or why didn't you like putting a term on a specific move? Yeah, that's, no, and I don't mind those terms. I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly what I said there or whether I flinched or <laughs> maybe, well, maybe I was tired. But no, I mean, I really appreciate, you know, now we're all the way up to double Falcon. And, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's nice to have some expressions, right? I mean, backgammon can be like a, you know, it's certainly an exciting game, but the terminology is pretty flat. So, so I, I think that's good. So, okay. what, whatever, whatever I said then, or however it came off, I, yeah, I don't feel that way. So, okay. And I think it's good that some people get get get, get credit. You know, with Woolsey's Law and you know, Hagen has his his thing. And, you know, I don't know if that's the mark of losers. And Michi has a couple already, and it, that's good. It's it's colorful. Not that you have to use those expressions every time the situation comes up, but you know it's fine. Okay. Okay. So let's uh, go back now to uh, your backgammon career because now we are in the '90s, and you've got uh, all these uh, the, these methods that you've been talking about so far, and you basically made it to the top of the game. Definitely, if not the best player in the in the mid uh, '90s, at, at for sure you were one of the one of the very best uh then we we kind of have some other stars coming up in the late 90s especially some of the danes like gus hansen or morty holm mass anderson um but that's kind of like where you kind of fell fell out of the game jerry grandell would be another 
start to mention there in the late 90s. Were you still in the game there when they this group no, came I, up? Or So so I, I met Jerry. I, I stopped playing in 97, and I'll get to that in, in a second. But I had met Jerry maybe a few years before in, in Monte Carlo for the first time. I remember we, we played by the, by the pool upstairs before the tournament ever began. That was my first interaction with them. And uh, yeah, very, very nice. A lot of these, they're all nice, but yeah, the Scandinavian influx, I think, um, yeah, the, the finalists or winner for a, a couple of those years, maybe before I, before I retired, um, the game was, yeah, definitely starting to pick up steam in other ports, which is how backgammon has migrated a lot. I mean, I, I remember there was a period where Argentina and Brazil is like completely taking off and they still have big clubs and mm -hmm. decent attendance, but not like it was for a period in, in the 90s and, and went on for, I don't know, maybe a decade or so. And then this, uh, you know, eventually, and in the States, of course, you know, they try to get this intercollegiate thing going, but, you know, it's basically the States, the people are just, the game is aging, unfortunately, for the most part, um, despite a few few rising stars in their, in their late teens, early 20s. But the Scandinavian thing is beautiful. Obviously, Japan um, is just tremendous. That I mean, and the Japanese, I don't, you can tell me, but I mean, it seems to me that it, it's centered on a few players. And, and from there, the, the word of mouth and the, and the street credibility, the prestige that these players were able to give the game, coming from traditions of Japanese chess and Go and, and so on, where backgammon didn't get that automatic um, cachet in some other countries it just caught on for different reasons but uh, yeah, yeah i i yeah. i thought this was great and but but i missed like a huge chunk of time and the reason was very simply then in 97 is when uh i got remarried and and my wife brought um at now our two kids uh, with her and i had been sports betting successfully now pretty successfully for a few years and, and I decided, you know, I'm just, I'm gonna focus on that because backgammon still, for the most part involves a certain amount of travel and I wanna be rooted and really get this family going. And also the, that the opportunities, the financial opportunities from backgammon had shrunk um, somewhat over the years, just in general. Part of it was, it was more difficult for me to get good games, but part of it was the, I don't know if it was economic stuff or just I, I think that the, the, the nerds had taken over and, and the vestiges of the 70s and 80s and kind of the flash and the rich people who wanted to play, that wasn't happening nearly as much anymore. So there was a very practical move that I made. And, um, and I, I didn't return to the game at all in any way until 2014. I mean, over like a 16 year period, I didn't study at all. Like I, I was aware of course of the programs coming online but I didn't study it. I didn't buy them. I didn't study at all. And I, I played just a little bit, I mean, very little. Mm -hmm. Did you so have a backgammon board in your house? Yeah, I, I didn't like throw away. It wasn't the, you know, uh, like uh, backgammon players anonymous or something. I mean, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't done with the game for sure. Yeah. I kept, I think I probably had a couple of backgammon boards and occasionally I would play with uh, one of the, one of the children, but they weren't into it yet. That happened much later. Okay. Okay, so you come back in 2014. First of all, what triggered you to start playing again? It, it was uh, just, it was situational. I went, so already we were living in Costa Rica and I came to the States to get my driver's license renewed in, in Las Vegas. And I did something wrong with the paperwork. I, I don't know, there was some snag. And so I was gonna have to be there an extra three days. And, and I, I, call, I texted my son, I said, um, hey, you know, how do I get, you know, this uh, XG program or something? And I could have looked online, but I, I felt like, you know, maybe he, he could help me do it. And so I, I bought XG and I was uh, just holed up for the, you know, other than getting buffets or something and, or seeing a show, I just holed up in my hotel room now playing XG. Because I was curious to see, it's understandable, curious to say, okay, well, I, I was terrific then. I'm sure the game has advanced a lot. I'm also pretty sure the game has not literally passed me by, uh, but I, I want to see how I play. So I began, I remember the first, not the first day, but the first couple of hours, I was just playing money games, no matches. And I was playing I know, like 4-2 or something. And 
And I sort of was aware of how well some of the people were playing, but I figured four two for my first twenty games was not too bad. And, I, and but I kept at it for six weeks, not in Las Vegas, my hotel room. I went home, but I, I was on vacation period at this point. So I played for six weeks, probably like thirty five hours a week, and reached a point where I was playing two eight um, at the beginning of, at the end of six weeks, and then I stopped. I, I didn't, you know, there's no one in Costa Rica to play. I didn't have. Whatever bug I might have had building for 16 years, it, it kind of went away because I just wanted to prove to myself that, you know, I, I could still be one of the better players. And, and that was it until for another six or seven months when my son came to me and said, hey, I'm starting to play backgammon with this guy who was my stepfather, you know, briefly earlier in life. And, um, and I'm thinking, you know, I'm like, because backhand has pluses and minuses. I mean, you know, it can be an addiction, a distraction when you're still in school and all this. And um, on the other hand, it can be a great game to teach logic and risk management and so many benefits, of course. And I decided I better step in and be his coach because this other guy is not very good to begin with. And he has, you know, some other issues, whatever. And it wasn't a rivalry thing, but it was just like, uh, okay, you know, my son's taking an interest. This is going to be a good bonding thing. Whatever negatives there are, I'll try to work through those if there are. And so he he brought me back into the game. It's like the Godfather Part Three, you know, just when I thought I was out, they bring me back in. In this case, it was my son, and it, I wasn't with the mom. So good, good news. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then you started playing online, right? Was it Grid Gammon, the first uh, online side you started playing? Yeah, and I think that was 2015, and that was, again, an NBA season had finished, and we did a little vacationing, and then I started playing, I think it was late July, so this would be, um, where are we? Yeah, 2015, right, at this point I was um, 56. Yeah. yeah, okay. So over the last five years, you've been playing online, you've been using Extreme Gammon, uh, you actually probably been improving quite a lot, I, I would assume, over these last five years. Uh, how would you say these, the, 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 last, the latest era of your backgammon career has went? Um, in, in terms of the you know, PR, which is obviously people focus on that a lot, and I do too. Uh, I, I was playing about 3-2 uh, for that, yeah, I think I played for eight weeks in, on, on grid gammon. Uh, in 2015, I was playing at 3-2, and, and each year would get a little better. The next year was 2-9, and then you start to plateau because it's, you know there's only so much room, and I 2-8. Yeah. And then I think last year, pretty much, if I had to guess, it was 2-7, and now, now it's 2-6. And, and honestly, um, there's always room for improvement, but between the amount of time and you know time commitment to chip away tiny you know problems in your game, and, and aging, I don't feel the effects of that yet, but you know that's gonna creep in, you know, at some point here. Um, you know, this might this is probably gonna be close close to my limit. Obviously, I feel very good about it. Um, yeah, it's it is an astonishing that. PR. Maybe you can um, maybe we can pick your brains a little bit about how do you because not it's not only about having the knowledge, uh, it's also about being able to perform at this level, and that's, this does take a, some some mental capacity. Uh, how do you keep focus uh, during so many games to, to play such a low PR? Do you have any tricks, or is it tr mental training, or what, what's your secret there? Yeah, I definitely have a methodology. So it's not it, you know similar to my learning the game. Nothing is random. Nothing is just because oh I'm very smart or something like that. I mean. The, so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, because uh, it's not that long, but I do want to share this with people cool. who might be curious. So be before playing a match online, or if I was in Monte Carlo back in my room before going downstairs, th there, there are a few basic things th that I do. Actually, in Monte Carlo, I was doing a, a little bit of meditation early in the day for maybe 30 minutes. And it's kind of a mindfulness meditation. So those who know that, I don't have to talk about it. Those who don't, they can look that up. I don't have to go into that too much. I, but before, if I'm going to play you in half an hour, I'm not doing some meditation. But I, I have some eye drops that I, I put in. You know, just some things are very fundamental here. Um, also, I mentioned something in Monte Carlo that people got, got a laugh out of and asked me later, is that true or are you just bullshitting with me? There's something about the nose, and you probably remember this. I, it, so I looked, I found this thing where 
if you, if you hold in uh, your left nostril, so your right nostril is open, uh, and you, you breathe pretty intensely. You can choose how many times you want to do this, seven times, 20 times. But if you want more energy, hold down the left nostril, free up the right one, and breathe it, breathe intensely um, for some, some duration. So that frees up more energy. You, sh you should wake up more, let's say, that you were a little bit tired. Conversely, if you were very caffeinated or very stressed or too hyped up for the match you're going to play, you do, do the opposite. Now, I can't claim for sure exactly how this is affecting me, but I've integrated it. You know, I'm using it, and, and who knows if it's helping or not. Um, I also splash a bunch of water on my face. This is supposed to be a, a good thing. Again, this is within like 10 minutes of playing. But I try to keep this. This is really happening. It's, you know, it's kind of building a momentum of all these, this cluster of little things that I'm doing. I also have one of these uh, head massagers, the, the, the ones that look like sort of a, an octopus. You know, they they're great. You may have seen these or sold them. Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah, they're really good. In fact, I was trying to hype Bob Wachtel on it recently. He's sort of like, okay, okay, if it's seemed pretty skeptical or maybe imagining if you don't have hair that you know, hurts your scalp. But uh, I have one of these and I, I use that. And I, it feels, you know, energizing and who knows if it opens some small portals in your brain. You know, again, maybe none of this is having any effect. It's just psychological. Right? Could be. Um, also make sure I always have water to drink when playing and I usually am hydrated uh, before playing. Not to the extent that I'm going to have to go, you know, take a leak during the match, but um, th that's, uh, that's important. And three physical things. So I do something where I'm standing up and I do a bunch of, of bouncing um, and, and keep my body as loose as possible. A lot of these things are about um, the psychology, not just the physiology, is about like keeping everything open. Um, you know, wh whether it's, it's, it's your, your mind, it's your body, it's this looseness, um, which, which I think is really important because you're gonna, obviously during the game, now let's bring it back directly into the game, you're gonna encounter a lot of stuff, sometimes in the first game, sometimes midway through the first game, where there's a lot of volatility. There, there are you know, decisions that aren't that familiar to you. And, and you need your, your vision your vision to be as expansive as possible. You need to be feel flexible to be able to adapt, not find yourself in game five and now you've gotten into the rhythm of things. You need to be there right away, um, hopefully, if you can. Uh, so the bouncing, I do a little bit of stretching where I just, you know, it doesn't matter your weight. I'm in pretty good shape, but even if you weren't, if you can stretch a little bit, you don't have to touch your toes, but just sometimes, you know, just like move your arms, try to get a little bit, you know, your hands a little bit lower to the ground if you can. And, and flop around a bit, kind of let your face just sort of go. And again, this, this openness and flexibility, and, you know, stretching in different ways, physically and, and psychologically. And the last one, this last one of this group is uh, balancing. So I do some standing on one, one leg and doing some different movements, uh, you know, while in that position. And I shift legs and, and do the other. Because again, this, the psychology of this it's about staying, staying in balance, staying, you know, staying, staying grounded, even if it's a little difficult, namely on one leg. Mm -hmm. um, so those are that's that's that cluster. Okay, that's it's it seems that you're very focused on the physiological aspects. Like it's it's not only just the, the your thoughts; it's your whole body that you're you're focusing on. Yeah, that's one side of it, yeah. and 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 the other side is not so much in the in the preparation, but these. Uh, key words, you can call them mantras or cue words or clue words or something like that. And I have a list of those. Now, I don't, I mean, some people are very good at remembering like all sorts of things. They can remember, you know, match equities for, you know, 35 to two to 60 or something, but, or at least they know the formula. But, but you know, yeah, you can color code these things in your mind or not. My list isn't very long. So, uh, you know, people can make their own lists. They're, they're, well recommended. This isn't like the Bible on these lists, mm -hmm. but some of my keywords, and I'll explain them just a little bit. But uh, open is one which I've already mentioned. I think mm -hmm. openness is really important. Trust, um, score effects, of course. So trust in what? Trust in your own abilities, or well, trust no, the, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll instead of just labeling, them, I'll, I'll go into them while I, I mention them. So so open has to do with um, vision, seeing the possibilities keeping your emotions open also. And, and the, what 
meaning that has for me is that like anybody, unless they're a robot, if you ha you're having like really easy game, I'm like I'm on this match winning streak and you know, like things is for whatever reason, right? This I'm obviously rolling very well, but things are almost going too easily. And even though I'm playing well, you can start to say, oh, well, you know, so it just, you start to lose a little bit of attention. It's, it's just being human. Winner like, sales. Like you want to make sure that you can increase the streak or you finish the match by shutting out your opponent, but it's natural to relax a little bit. And so, so open is not getting into this, um, you know, past and future mentality. So you're winning five nothing, and the other player seems to be making some mistakes. You're feeling good, and you sort of imagine, well, this match will be open here, you know, or whatever it is, right? This is like, okay, I'm going to win my fifth match in a row. Mm -hmm. You're already counting it up. There's just even if you do that for a microsecond, it, it has some effect, I think, of you know, keeping you away from being grounded and really mm -hmm. seeing the board in front of you yeah. at the moment. And 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 the same thing can happen if you're losing. You're on a losing streak. You're having a crummy match. You know, it, that now you're thinking, okay, you know, I've lost again, or I can't wait to see how XG shows how terribly I'm planning. So you really, it's important to find ways, you know, and sometimes a key word, you know, may or may not work for you. It works for me, or I feel that it does work for me. Just keep yeah. coming back to open. So yeah. I, instead of constriction in my body when things aren't going bad or, you know, whatever, that I just, for, the word open reminds me physically and mentally to stay open. Cool. Trust is is trusting in values. So trusting in my, my understanding of, you know, the math of the game, going through the process, the methodology of, of crunching, you know, evaluations of the next role in, in key moments where that kind of number crunching could really make the difference in, you know, making the right play or not. Oh, we got some internet problems here. Oh, Will, we're just shutting off. Hello. You're back. That was, that was my fault. It, it's, ah. it's not something permanent, but it was my fault. Okay. No worries. No. We're good. Okay, so let's All resume. Right. You were, you were t telling us about uh, your second mantra, which was um, oh. open was the first. And what was the second one? Freezing. Uh oh, it's still, mm. it's still You're freezing. Yeah, it's freezing a bit. It's freezing. Oh, okay, now, okay. Uh, yeah, it did this the first time as well, and maybe something it does in the beginning. Let's hope we. Yeah. Okay, guys, so we're back here. We had a little technical problem. Uh, Will was telling us about his uh, mantras, and we already covered open. And the net, what was the next one, Will? Yeah, we're into tr trusting values. So, trusting so values. again, it's trust. You know, tr trust what you understand, because in in the middle of playing for money or match or whatever, you're not going to suddenly take a leap in your learning. But 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 trust what it is that you do know, you know, as as well as possible. Um, despite the fact that you may be getting rolled into the ground. Uh, you know, just maintain a, a trust of that and maintain a, a, a focus because this comes up especially in a lot of doubling uh, positions where you know, you have a race lead or you have certain aspects which you know are good, you get a good chance of winning a game and let's say, you know, you're thinking of doubling. But, but make sure you look at the whole board because there's a, a tendency, I think even if you're a very strong player, to get locked into one aspect of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, this could, you know, happen for any number of reasons, but, but, but trust that if you simply allow yourself to literally scan the whole board and not too fast to pick up on, yeah, those blots in the inner board make a difference. And, you know, the fact that there's no presence in, in what I call quadrant two, you know, just outside of your home board. You know, this their little thing or a dilly builder here, or, all these things have, have values. And some players may have a pretty good estimation of exactly what these things are worth, but make sure you're at least plunging these things into your equations. Um, and, and again, to, you know, to, to trust that you've developed a good enough process, you have a good enough sense of the game, that if you go through the process during the game, it's a, a great benefit. And you'll regret it a lot later if you skip some of these steps. Yeah, I can I can relate to this. I think this is something I, I kind of learned as well. Um, in my early years, I, I came up quite fast. Like when I, I took up the game when I was like 16, no, sorry, 17. 
And within a year, a year or so, I was already playing like at a four and a half, five, and competing with the best players. Uh, but it wasn't until several years later that I, I, I kind of learned what you're saying here to trust your your skills because especially if you are in a, in a, uh, in a crowd with, um, with a lot of other good players, for instance. Uh, in a duet or in a consultation or simply just like in a social situation where you're discussing positions, you can easily get confused or get uns unsure of yourself and stuff like this. So I, I really feel what you're saying here. Trust your, when you're over the board, trust your, your methods and your knowledge. And usually, I mean, if you do that, you, you play quite well, but it's the way, when you start to get confused and, and, and doubt yourself, then that, that's can, that can really, really dissolve your to your complete your complete understanding of or your, your performance so to say not your understanding your, it can destroy your performance so that's a good yeah, one I, I, absolutely um you got more yeah score is of course if you're playing a match are you going to be but i mean if if i'm at you know zeros if i'm at two two to 13 or whatever some even score where it's not particularly relevant what the score is yet I will, because I don't want to hold all these you know, words in my mind all the time. I won't have score. I can immediately default back to the next game. There's a one point lead or the significant score. I mean, you know, score, score effect for sure is on the list and almost like vibrating because I want to make sure that not only for the cube decisions, but of course, for some of the checker uh, plays, you know, that you really want to make sure that you don't, uh, that you don't lose, lose track of how prime, you know, primary that, uh, that component is, so that's that's obvious. Um, other words again that you know I don't always keep you keep all these words. It sort of depends on my mentality or if I feel like I've sort of lost you know in recent notes of evaluating my play after reviewing things that I'm losing some amount of courage or forgetting to appreciate the backgammon. I often make Facebook post comments. I just say, remember backgammon is a volatile game. You know, like sometimes you just have to embrace the volatility. You know, you're, you're doubling with like a bare edge because it's a super volatile moment for gammons and mm -hmm. uh, market losers at the same time, or you're having to take like a, something you wouldn't dream of taking just because of the match score. And, um, you just have to, you know, you don't have to love the volatility, but you just have to live with it and and not and not resist it and remember that most of your opponents um if you get into the mentality where you're pretty okay with the volatility most other opponents still aren't i mean you know, it's like yeah the elite players by and large are but a lot of other players you know you're you're doubling something in the fir first game and you think you know yeah maybe this isn't quite a double but it's also one that can lead to a lot of gammons and set a tone for the match and and the other players like you know almost thinking it's too early and and, and you win a gammon or you know maybe you don't even know what their cube decision is going to be later this gets into other stuff but i mean just be willing to do the thing that's a little more volatile mm -hmm. when you're in doubt at all you know, okay. partially because you don't know how the other person's going to respond to it or deal with the effects of it if it goes sideways is this something that's uh, comfortable in your personality or are you actually more of a risk averse type that you kind of have to force yourself into this kind of mentality? I, I'm probably somewhere in the middle, but, but, I, but I will say like as far as my own you know, aspects of my game, which I've had to work through from, from very early from back in the 90, you know, in the when I was 20 or something. Granted, once I became pretty good that the other players you know, were, were not good and there's some aspect of risk management, whatever. But I definitely passed too much. No question. I was kind of a kind of a locksmith the way I played, but also because I sort of thought the, these things were passes, and I didn't I didn't get into. I just needed some coach to tell me, remind me, look, you're better than these players, so don't worry if you think it's a pass against yourself, which it may or may not be. But it's a take against almost all these other players, unless you're running into uh, you know a capital uh, restriction. Mm -hmm. And so I, I didn't. You get that. So there was a part of me that was, I was a gambler and I had sports betting issues. So I was kind of reckless on the one hand, but in backgammon when I was too tight, if anything. Okay. And, and even as of the last few years, if you ask a few better players that you know, played against me enough on online, I, I would say that there was probably some consistency to their thinking, well, I, I think he passes a little bit too much. Okay. And, and so I, I still had to work that through. Not as much, not as much. Okay. But, 
Uh, something that I wanted to ask you, well, um, because in terms of match play and match theory, we've got kind of two different approaches to, to match play. You got like the very intuitive based, which would you could name players like Falafel or Sandra Lilov, who they don't really give a shit about formulas and calculations and stuff. For them, it's more they can just feel the tension at four way, three way, and oh now it's or it's, now it's three way, three way. So you, they just know how to adjust, if you know what I mean. They don't do sit there and do calculations. And then you have another school of thought that are that those are the players that are very like theoretical minded. They like the calculations almost. They they do all these match equity. Uh, they try to solve the math problem, and they even have methods of doing it over the board. So how would you categorize you? Where would you fall in this uh, specter? I I'm I'm somewhere in the middle. Uh, which may, I, you know, I don't know if it surprises some, some people or not. I, I think it's commonly assumed that I'm totally into the math. And then when I say that I'm not, that I'm lying. <laughs> so all I can tell you is, you know, I don't have a Bible or anything here, but um, I, I know most of the math, but, uh, you know, John O'Hagan, uh, just to name one person, the many were, you know, terrific, Art Benjamin, I, there's just, you know, so many that I don't even know. Uh, who were were terrific um, at, at the the math of it. I practiced it a lot. Could I be as uh, as quick as them? I I think so, but I've been a little bit lazy in that department, and, and I, I it's probably cost me a fraction here and a fraction there. But I know it. I know the numbers well enough, especially the key scores. Um, that what's more important at some point, of course, is what are you plugging into those equations? You know, how do you perceive the current position? Because it's great to have the formulas down, but if you're you know, off by any, to any significant degree of the position at hand, it's not just a race, but it has some complexity to it. Um, that's where, you know, that's, those are the key numbers for sure. And, yeah. and I think I'm very good at that. Again, some people are probably better. I think, you know, Mochi, I think, has, you know, tre tremendous, uh, you know, collection in his head, weeded down to, you know, key ones where he knows the, the gammon rate and the, 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 the effects on match winning chances and stuff like that. And I'm sure he's not alone, but I, I've seen some stuff that they indicate he's he's very good at having tons of benchmarks. Yeah, we, we, which I also don't really. I mean, I, I have you know basic holding games, and you know there's some positions that or you know two men closed out. Obviously, there's some basic things. Of course, I have. But there's some other positions where you know I could be off it by I don't know more than five percent of the gamma chances. Um, where, whereas a few players are definitely closer to the truth. Yeah. Okay. Again, there's some. There's, I'm getting to kind of know how 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 you think because again here uh, there are different. I wouldn't say schools, but different approaches. There's there's not just one way to becoming a grandmaster, obviously. And some players, like you say, uh, are very into memorizing reference positions, for instance. And uh, and you say you don't really have too big of a database. Of that going on so so what is it then is it more like uh, you understand the principles that you want to apply and then you can kind of apply it to whatever position that you're facing yeah there's a lot of um i don't have a photographic memory but but i have a very a, apparently a very strong uh, pattern recognition capacity a and um which is really valuable. I think it was Mike Sankowitz first said to me that, because he knew that I didn't play chess, and he said, but, you know, he'd been around me long enough, he said, I, I, I see the board like a chess player. I, you know, I, I'm sure that can mean many different things. Part of it is certainly the pattern recognition aspect, um, and, you know, I'm sure it goes beyond that. But, yeah, I, I, I'd say, and, and the second thing that, that you were sort of saying, like the right questions to ask, I, I, in writing about my mistakes, I try to really verbalize it as much as possible. I'm sure you do too, of course you're a writer. Um, but I try to create stories and they don't always appear, the, the stories, but I would say every hundred notes that I take, I come up with some fresh way of describing something that I don't memorize it, but it's some, there's a stickiness to it. And especially because most people of course now are, you know, type everything on the computer. I still use a lot of hand notes. It's just my old fashioned organic, you know, hand, pen and paper. 
Mm -hmm. and, and I think things stay with me perhaps a little bit more because of that. Um, I'm not, I'm sure no one's going to shift as a result of my saying this because everyone's it's all about the keyboard and, and you know, storing stuff uh, you know, in the cloud or wherever. But I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, I think it does a little bit. Uh, there was another topic that I, I kind of wanted to mention just before when we talked about um, the, these players who are really good at calculating over the board. Uh, this is kind of one of my theories that uh, it, it's it's taken inspiration from uh, Daniel Kahneman, who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow. I don't know if you read that book or know of him. Uh, Kahneman, you said? Kahneman, yes. An Israeli psychologist who won the Nobel Prize in economics. But his idea was that you have basically two systems in your brain. You've got system one, you've got system two. System one is the automatic system that your body does just does on your behalf you don't have to think about it and system two is the deliberate system where you have to use computations in your brain and it takes effort and actually a lot of people they don't like using system two it kind of hurts you know counting the pips it's if you're not used to it it can be kind of painful uh, of course track uh, training and experience helps a lot um, I, I kind of feel like a little bit like you talked about with the openness when you sit over the board that you have to have an open mind and you have to be sharp because there's this thing in backgammon that where it's it's definitely not as tactical as chess. Like t chess is hyper tactical. They do calculation on lines all the time for three hours straight. It's so demanding. It's, backgammon is a little bit demanding, but it's not that demanding. It's much more relaxing to play a backgammon match. So it's not as computational heavy. Uh, but there is computation, there is tactics going on. We have to keep uh, an eye on the dice probabilities all the time. And it can be crucial whether to leave six shots or eight shots on any given uh, position. But I feel like there's a trade-off. And maybe that's one of the reasons where someone like Falafel evolved into becoming a very intuitive player. But for whatever reason in his personality or something, it, he he was obviously, obviously very competitive and stro strove to be the best player he could be. But there's a trade-off in terms of using your system one, uh, or sorry, your system two, because you're kind of distracting your system one. So the more calculations you do, the less aware or open you are, or the more you distract your pattern recognition. So how do you find this balance in backgammon? Because it is both strategical and tactical at the same time. In, in my own case, I'm more likely to, um, forget to slow down enough to, to do the appropriate number crunching. I just always call it number crunching. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more likely to do that um, than have a problem with the, like the, the board vision and, and the sort of intuitive sense of what's, what's going on. So that, that's, my, that's my breakdown. I mean, I, you know, I have breakdowns on the other side too, but it's more likely to be that occasionally, of course, that I, I even forget one sliver of the equation, which ends up being, you know, critical. There's like, you know, yeah, you can hit or not hit, but there's just like this third slice where, you know, something else is going on. And obviously you need to keep all the variables together. Otherwise the mm -hmm. equation is worthless. Yeah, but, that's well, I mean, for, in, yeah. in Falafel's case, I know we're talking about, you know, my story, but I mean, in Falafel's case, I mean, he did like a tremendous amount of work too. I mean, he really did study with, as far as I know, oh, yeah. he studied extensively. Probably more than anyone. Like he didn't do anything but playing backgammon and studying backgammon. Yeah. But the way yeah. he studied was never to calculate equations of match equity. He, he, he studied by looking at positions and analyzing right, his right. games. Which, yeah, which is the meat and potatoes of the game. And, 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 yeah. and gets to me, but it's my case, not simply for what we're talking about as far as numbers versus intuition, but that, um, I, I, I'm big on trying to help people, you know, where I can, depending on where they are, or if they want to even hear my ideas or something, on how to learn efficiently. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things, in my opinion, unless you're already so good that all you have left are refining match equities and getting these race formulas and keep it more perfected, you know, things that are really not, they're fine, but they're sort of in the weeds relative to the essential aspects of backend, the meat and potatoes of backend. And that's one thing that I, when I was in my 20s and moving forward, I didn't focus on the things that weren't coming up that much. 
I knew races well enough, but I didn't like go crazy trying to, you know, people always showing me these race positions. I saw, you know, I think it's this, if it's not, you know, maybe I'll learn something, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because races actually only come up, I'm not sure the exact number, but like 10% of the games it, do races even meaningful races. Like you can be in a race, but someone's up by 20 pips in the game, it's actually over for a long time. You know, and, and the races where knowing the formula of right, you know, it's, this is probably going to come up 3% of the time. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not that it's not important. It could really be critical at the end of a big match. Or, or, or understanding back games. The back games are beautiful. The, even, you know, it's like a lot of, you know, incredibly big mistakes we made. But I think it was Mochi that said they come up like 3%. Yeah, so 2 or 3% of the time. Yeah, it's all well and good to get to that point where you're also including them in what you're going to learn about. But I, I would keep this way on the back burner. Like if you're so good, I mean, even prime versus prime doesn't come up a lot, but it's more fundamental to the game because priming questions come up a lot just in the general flow of things. They don't have to be prime versus prime. But understanding primes is really valuable. But, you know, like in your books and some other people who've written well on, you know, a lot of the you know essential, you know, these holding games and... Um, you know, gammon probabilities for certain sort of natural looking positions. And there's just so many things that you know as, as in playing that, hey, this stuff it comes up a lot. Learn that stuff as well as you can. And when you're going through, um, you know, the XG files of, of, you know, either your collected mistakes or the most recent match or money session or whatever, I, I wouldn't check all, I wouldn't make notes about or freak out about your blunder in some territory that you're not supposed to know that much about yet. Mm -hmm. You can, but I don't think it's good for your psychology to beat yourself up about things that are not really in your main domain yet. Mm -hmm. and, and just focus on things that are coming up, you know, like second, third bolts of the game. I mean, you don't have to necessarily know these 95%, but it's good not to be making too many mistakes in these first few rolls. Um, it sets a tone. They're easy enough to, you know, kind of. So in terms of that. efficient learning, try to focus on core principles rather than go into some very specific that actually doesn't really happen too often. Yeah. Yeah. Just just sa save that for, you know, say, well, yeah. I have a five year learning plan that's mm -hmm. in year like 4.8, you know, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. whatever. Uh -huh. um, that, that would be you know one of the things that, that I would advise. And I would yeah. also say, since we're just a little on the subject, of, of how to learn. Um, for for cube decisions, there can be some cube decisions where, yeah, uh, you know, making a 0.04 error if you're already a very good player in a certain type of cube decision, maybe is significant. By and large, even for myself, I only start looking at cube errors that are really of like the 0.08 in the, in the blunder territory. And, and I just, I'm not saying I'll never look at something that's lower than that, but I, but because the cube is very volatile and we all, almost, there's no one in the world, I think, who plays better with the cube than they do with checker play, it's understood that your cube errors are gonna be more violent. Yes, yeah, because in checker plays, you have the comparison to the other moves, whereas in cubes, you don't, it's kind of like- It's all or none, yeah. Yeah, you, that's all you got. Um, okay, uh, anything more you wanna say, Will, about this, uh, your, your ideas about effective learning? Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's good. Uh, to, to put your, your errors into categories. Now, you can use, you know, your categories or, and your categories are very traditional that, you know, you, you're, you're working with and that appear in your, in your books and going forward. Um, or you can create some of your own that, you know, or have your own vocabulary for them. Maybe they're the same categories, but some word works for you, resonates better for you. You know, you just want to try ways to make this less boring, more, more personal. And, um, and, and just yeah, hone in on certain segments that you said, well, this is, seems to be coming up a lot. And try, and try to understand what it is that you're tending to do too much or too little. I, and some of these are very simplistic because obviously it's a very nuanced game, as you were saying, and of course we all agree. But just you're hitting too much, <laughs> which I, I will say that if people are hitting too much or too little, they're absolutely hitting too much. There's, this, there's no question about it because you want to, you know, it's all about, you know, the component is the race and that that's like the main reason you're hitting people. Also, it's fun to hit people. It's just, you know, it's a very, it's like, you know, the child, oh, I got a choice to hit you, I'm hitting you. Um, so, you know, maybe look at that as, as one of the things that you're, you're doing too much. Um, that you're, you know, maybe even though the race doesn't come up at the end of the game, 
so much, obviously the race is still a very central feature to making a lot of decisions. And if it turns out that, you know, you can spot that you're really not including the race, you know, even though you've got, let's say you're playing on a galaxy and you've got the race there, you're not having to even calculate it, but you're not paying attention to the race for some reason, you know, it, there, there's so many things that you can do, but narrow your category. So you're not trying to learn everything at once. You're not trying to fix everything at the same time. You just go through stages where you're working maybe on just a couple of things. You're focusing on those and when you're playing, you're just thinking in terms of those things a little more than you used to. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to think about, oh, I just made a mistake in this kind of thing before. You don't want to get into a head trip. You just want to like chip off little slices of the areas where you're having problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really good. Um, another thing that we just uh, talked about before, uh, we, we, we mentioned falafel twice, and I, I, it, I just uh, remember something else that's kind of... Uh, something we can compare between you and falafel falafel always loved to see his analysis of his matches right after the match and then after he's seen it he didn't care about it anymore you can just i mean he just want to see his blunders see the interesting decisions and that's it then he move on to the next and there's an unlimited amount of pagamon position coming in the future i know that your method is kind of like you go into a play mode and then you just play 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 and then you go into an analysis mode where you analyze all your matches at once Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, methodology? Again, th this is personal. I, I think I think the the natural. I won't say human as a you know framing myself as non-human or something, but but the the natural tendency is you want to get feedback quickly. Yeah, and maybe you have a couple of specific things in mind. Maybe you know something toward the end of the match or whatever some some big cue decision. But but we but we also because we think it's fresh. If I see it now it's going to make a bigger difference than if I see it in two days. Well, again, it depends on you know, the, the individual makeup. I, I find that two or three days later, I still remember what was going on. I, I don't mean I had the match memorized. I just mean that for key decisions, you know, in, any of the mistakes, I, I remember sort of what my thinking was, even if it was sort of intuitive or I played pretty quickly or whatever. And occasionally I played it quickly and I didn't really think. So that's a different category. But I mean, anything that I thought about for at least a few seconds where I thought it was a question, I, I remember what I was thinking. And, and so it, it doesn't lose any quality for me. And I actually feel somehow better having a little bit of detachment from the experience, whether I went won or lost. So you think, well, if, if you're more inclined to look, I guess, if you just lost, because you want to figure out, you know, what the hell you did wrong. If you won, you feel like, yeah, well, of course, that's great. Or, you know, just like basking in it. You know, you'll see the mistakes at some point. You don't want to put a damper on your good feeling. Like, it's like you actually played terribly and you won. Like, I can't stand that. I'm sure you're the same way. You know, okay. many, especially the more elite you are, the more the tendency is. If you won and you play like crap, oh, yeah, no. it helped a little bit that you won, but yeah. not much. I don't know. It's horrible. Unless you just won Monte Carlo or something. Yeah. And Do you, you give yourself the excuse, well, I was tired. Do you get an emotional response to your blunders? Like, do they hurt? Um, You know, for, for for a few seconds, yeah, I, I would say the initial is, you know, like, geez, I thought I was better than this, or, you know, what was I thinking, or I underfactored this, or I should have known better, or I forgot a calculation. But that's like, it's pretty small. It's there, though. Yeah, yeah. there's definitely like, you just touch a stove, and the yeah. stove happens to be your, you know, your brain deadness or whatever. Yeah. But, but after that, I, I always feel like, wow, you know, I know I'm always making some mistakes for sure, and they're going to come in different categories and different different sizes. And you know, this is just one. And many times, when I'm really philosophical about it, I'd rather make some big mistakes so that hopefully it's from or be reminded strongly of than making a lot of little mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I just I think you're more likely to learn faster if you, you know, keep making like some pretty significant mistakes, especially if it's in a category that you can define. Do you think this emotional reaction you get, like you say, it's like touching a hot stove. Um, I guess it's kind of helping you to improve your game and to uh, add more data to your database or something, right? This emotional attachment. I mean, you would you don't want to have too much emotion because then you can go and tilt and you're not thinking clearly. But yeah. you can't play with if you don't have any emotion. I mean, how are you gonna 
learn really right because then you just uh, yeah yeah, what do you think yeah. about this? Yeah, you have to care. Yeah, you have yeah. right. There has to be some level of, of caring and mm -hmm. pride and um, wanting to figure something out. You know, drive to figure things out better than than you figured them out previously. Mm -hmm. And and even if it's not just the game itself, maybe maybe it's there, there's something about this type of position that you know, like you're you're a little bit like you were saying, you're too risk averse or too too grabbing the volatility and. And finding out if there's a, you know, it's not even about understanding the game, it's about your own emotions. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, another question. Um, among the elite players, you have play different personality types, obviously. Uh, and one of the things that different, the, the behavior of the players in terms of playing, some players, they like to just play all the time. They can't get enough of backgammon. They just want to play, 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 play. And then uh, there's some in the other category, which... I would probably be more in the other category where it's like, I don't want to play all the time because I want to have something at stake or I want to compete. Then it's fun for me. It's not fun just to play whatever. Uh, and in my online uh, play, sometimes I play like where I'm too tired to play, but I just play anyway. You know, uh, it seems you, you strike me as the kind of, of, of grandmaster that you only play when you are in there to compete. Is that true? Or would you also just take a casual game now and a, now a, now and again, and you don't care about your PR too much in this game? Yeah. Well, th this is the way I do it. If if I'm if I'm playing um, a good player, I I, I always want to be. Now you're never going to be an optimal freshness, whatever that would mean. But it, but I mean I, I always really want to be there because I also figure they're they're there. And maybe they aren't. Maybe they're actually tired, but they just want to play me or something. But but I I save all the sort of not blow off where I just don't care or don't try. But I, I say I save those. I actually go to the other other site and play some DMPs or play some short matches with friends of mine. And sometimes we're, you know, chatting at the same time or I'm, you know, trying to teach them something. Or sometimes they're very good anyhow, we're just playing. And uh, I like that as a break. But 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 I prefer to, you know, if I'm really gonna play, I'm gonna play for points or, you know, ranking or whatever, I, I'm gonna be there. And, and I actually was uh, like two months ago. I mean, not like for the whole this whole street, but beyond that, I, I started grading how I felt before playing the match. Wow! From one, yeah. to, from one to ten, and I never done this before. You think I sound pretty methodical? I could have been doing this for years, but actually, I just started this a couple of months ago. And and my average, you know, feeling fresh rating is probably like uh, close to an eight. When, when I'm playing, and occasionally I'll regrade it because, like during the match, I'll feel like no, I really wasn't, you know, I was kind of not awake enough or playing too early or something. And I'll, I'll downgrade it. But I'm doing this, you know, to kind of test because there's a range. I mean, a few times I've played it like a five or six, never below that. And I'm trying to see if I can build up a big enough sample to see if there really is much of an effect of, you know, how tired or awake yeah. or caffeinated or all, all these things. But by the way, on that subject, I think I got it from. Sander or somebody, somebody was interviewed many several years ago on YouTube, and they were just talking about their own preparation before playing matches at a tournament. And this person said, yeah, they don't drink, I didn't think they don't drink any caffeine at the tournament at all. They certainly don't drink it any time within two hours of a match. And they also don't eat within two hours of the match. And the exception is not from this person, but I mean, the exceptions are occasional, I'll have, you know, whether it's like some raw vegetables or fruit or something like that. I, I really kind of stick to that because I have found that when I'm a little bit too wired, and I didn't used to be sensitive to caffeine really, but I'm sick. And, and, and I am, it's just like, you know, I can have tea and I'll like just keep the tea bag in there for like a minute and I'm, you know, kind of like this for the next hour. So I have things, you know, that I do and don't do. Um, the, the, the one thing you were saying, yeah, about, uh, you know, taking, Things seriously. Well, there, there was the the batches. I I, I do feel like um, you know playing you know let's say for you know a couple of days and then seeing the matches later. Seeing the batches together, if you can have that patience, you are rewarded by getting some continuity of of the types of errors instead of just doing them piecemeal. And and that's something I feel is a benefit. And, and people who aren't used to that could at least experiment with. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I didn't think about that point actually. So you, yeah, you get like a, a, a broader view of, of trends in your in your game. If you have some biases here and there, uh, 
Yeah, okay, that's cool. Uh, Will, let, I want, really want to get on to, uh, we, we're heading on like an hour and a half now, so I really want to get on to a little bit of uh, backgammon positions, just to see. Okay, see, okay. So I, I found a couple of positions here, so in, it's actually uh, a couple of uh, quiz positions here from my, my second book, uh, Pure Strategy. So the first one, uh, let me just find it here. And, and I have to send you the position. Of course, I should have done this beforehand. But I'm going to show the viewers here while I set up the position. And then I'm going to send you a screenshot of the position. So I'm going to transition okay. into All the right. screen. And it's a checker play. So it's a 6-4. Let me just clear the board. I'm, I'm entering this zone of our conversation with modesty, humility. I have all these car, car, my, my uh, mantras. Right? Good. Um, <laughs> low expectations. Yeah, because actually it's not too easy to do backgammon quizzes because your mind has just been somewhere completely else. And all of a sudden, I'm forcing you into making a tough <laughs> decision here. Okay, yeah. so I, I got the position set up for the for the viewers. Okay, we're doing one at a time, right? We're doing one at a time, yeah. So let me just send you this position right now on okay. Facebook, and then you can have a look, and then we can talk about it. Okay, okay. so here we go. So it's a 6-4 checker play for white. So take your time, and then when you're ready, you can start talking about the position. Sure. Okay. Yeah. At least, at least you're not throwing in any weird match scores, so I don't have to. <laughs> it's zero zero at eleven. Below below gaskets. Yeah, eleven away, eleven away. So it's basically the same whether it's for money or match. Okay. And the viewers, of course, they can think as well. Yeah, so we, I mean, it looks like we have, without having made a decision yet, but we have like three basic plays. We can break the 15, we can go 15 to nine and cover the ace. We can attack on the deuce and cover the ace. Yeah, and, uh, I guess okay, that's so the we, three alternatives. That's, that's the first thing to do, identify the choices, especially when you know it's a quiz problem. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I don't think really it has quiz factor in this position. It's it's basically, no, no, and no, I want to take a, no. a, a tough position, okay. but not that tough position. So it, it's right. not an easy position by any means, but not super crazy either. Okay. So just just talking aloud. The um, so if you break the fifteen, which is clean, you're not giving any shots, you are starting to, con you, know, you, you have conceded outfield control, albeit you have this, you know, decent kind of prime formation to hopefully hem in the guys in the 21, but seeding the, the outfield is a, a real effect. On the other hand, you're getting rid of the 15 point, which is, needs to be dealt with, and this is an awfully good way to take care of that. And the outfield, the, you, you prefer to have the outfield here because of the blot on the 24 still has a way to go. Yeah, it, 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 I'm not saying that I'm not getting rid of the 15, but I'm saying that's that's the concern. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the with giving up the outfield. The, the attack play, uh, the, one of the pro I mean, all, all these plays, you're not such a big favorite in the position due to the outfield. Your opponent has an anchor you're way up in the race, but in some ways that's a detriment to the timing of things. Um, the attack play, in my opinion, you don't have a double if he fans. And, and that's one of the things, at least, that I, I look at. You know, you're being instantly rewarded by the bad rolls, and that's not the case. It doesn't mean the play's wrong, but that's, it, it discounts the effect of an attacking play here. Um, and this third play of making the nine and making the ace, I, I, I think that has to be out of consideration. I don't, you know, so I don't know if it's second or third, but because the 15, breaking the 15 clean has to be better than that. Like there's just no, yeah. no reason just to make the ace point and have a four point board to give um, whatever it is, like 16 shots out there and, and be drawing, not completely dead, but looking pretty bad. That, that has to be out of the running. So what about, there's a fourth play as well, Will. What about uh, nine to three and then cover the ace? Yeah, there is a fourth play. That that just uh, that yeah. I, I guess I just sort of got rid of that one because you're now you've got this one spare. You're very stiff. 
Uh, you haven't done anything with the 15 point. You know, granted, he's got to come to you to some extent. You may be shooting at the next roll, but if you were going to play that, then you may as well make an attacking play now, even though you were going to be giving 13 shots. In the room, I think. I'm not going to go on too much further with this. I, I'm, I'm going to vote for breaking the 15, and I can live with being wrong. Okay, actually, uh, that's the first, third best play. So okay. the, the best play is the fourth play, where you play safe. Um, really? And simply just okay. uh, simply just uh, play to the three point and then cover the ace and don't leave any shots. The second best, best play, which is half a blunder or 54 milli points, is the attacking play. And then we got the, the two men down and make the nine point. That's 130 on XG plus. So that's a all blunder. All right. All right. Well, the, the benefit I get is, as I said before, that what, when I make a significant error is where I can learn the most. Uh -huh. So what, what do you think here? What, what, what went wrong here? And why do you think the best play is the safe play here? Um, it, it, the outfield control ends up being uh, a real key component. I, I'm going to guess that, that that's probably the Trump element. There are other you know, minor elements going on here, but that, that has to be the big, uh, the big factor, I think. Okay. What, what do you think? I mean, you you studied. I mean, I, I have I have this position in my book, so of course uh, I have already done an extensive analysis on this position. I think right, that right. Uh, this is kind of like a position where you're fighting to get your one man back freed, and we're up forty pips, so we really don't want to get hit. And even the attacking play, even though it looks nice and it's more it's more efficient in terms of not putting that daily builder on the three point. Uh, it, it's just too much to leave the, the 12 shots that we leave from here. Or, no, sorry, 13 shots. Right, and we, with my play, we're still leaving six shots, which was... With yeah. your play, it's something like, yeah, we get six, one, four, three, and five, four. Yeah, so six right. shots. Six, six, six yeah. shots. Okay. And it's, it's kind of like a priming position. While we're not really want, in a priming game here, I think we're more in a, in a running game, actually. We want to get free that back checker. Uh, but okay, okay, good. I, I got to trick you there. This was a tricky one. Okay, let yeah. me give you one more. You get the chance to redeem yourself. No, 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 no pressure. It's, it's good. I, I don't, I don't <laughs> feel pressure. Good. Uh, okay, okay, let me just put it up here for the viewers first, and then I'll send it to you. So this is another one from Pure Strategy. Let's put it this way. I, I, would, I would rather play really well and, and win. I, second is I would rather play really well and lose and in third is i would rather win or lose and, and learn and it's not that far behind so good good one okay so it's again it's an 11 point match okay uh let me just send you the, the screenshot here okay here we go so it's a 5-1 from the bar zero zero to 11 we're up five pips before the move. And what do you think? And the viewers can have some time to think as well. Okay, so we've got four plays. Like one, two, one, two. No, basically three plays, all right. Well, I, I don't imagine 24 and 8 is right because we've got the blots and it's leaving 15 shots, even if the fives are duplicated a lot. I don't think I would, I would do that with the blot behind. Uh, coming on the 20s, so we get rid of double threes and fives and add double fours. Okay, so that's 15 point making numbers. Seems like a lot, but then we get still get hit loose quite a bit, and we have the blot, and he's got the anchor. So can we be just patient here? Pile up, pile up builders on the top points. Eventually, make the ace point and and leak out later. All right, I'm not going to belabor it. And I'm mm -hmm. willing to be wrong again. Um, 
I'm going to go 24 and 5. 24 and 5. Okay. Yep. That's, the, that's the second best. I all got right. you again, Will. It's that's a, all right. It's a tricky one. Um, the best... Oh, one second. There we go. The best play here is actually to come up under the gun and take the fight now. Twenty, Come in on the 20 point and play 10 to 9. Okay. Um, as yeah, you correctly discarded uh, 13 to 8 uh, as the first one, as the worst of the three, leaving the direct shot. And uh, it's according to XT Plus, it's a small blunder. I think I analyzed a little bit deeper in the book, and it I think it was a little bit less. It's like a small blunder, or a little bit less than a blunder to play make your move. So here the idea is to come in and take the fight now uh, under the gun. What do you think about that move? Why is that the right move? Uh, well, yeah, I had figured if you were up more in the race than, than you are, I mean, you are up in the race, but if you were, if I was up more, then I would have made that play. I felt like I wasn't up quite enough to, to deal with the, um, with the blowback of, of this not working out. And I guess I, maybe I was overfactoring our blot on the ace point, too, as far as some of the scenarios where you hit and you know, you've still got some issues if he hits back immediately and so on. I got um, a, I got a new expression from reading Bill Roberti's new book. Actually, he calls it uh, the rack. When you got the structure of having the four, five, six points, he calls it the rack, and uh, right. the rack the okay. rack is pretty strong. You know, the so, rack is very strong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I th and the and the eight six five four combination is is super potent, uh -huh. especially for getting some cubes in. Or conversely, if you're thinking of taking that, if you got that, you know, your turnarounds are obviously so much uh, so much. Yeah. But by the way, that that segues into, I, I know everyone's big on the you know PRAT, you know where it's uh, where position Threat. race threats, but but for myself, um, the uh, the position aspect, you know I think some people have probably broken this down of what it means to them, but I, I don't think there's, uh, as far as I know, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's a lot of agreement of. The, of how to define what the position term means? Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, That's now you're true. heading down my uh, my alley because this is what I covered basically in this. I, I totally agree. It's too vague okay. to define, and I, I made a better definition in my own opinion. Well, uh, well my yeah, and, and I look forward to re reading your <laughs> your better definition so you don't uh, spill the beans here. Um, but my third term, which I think is key, is, is turnaround. So we have an extra T. We get rid of the P. We have an extra T. This is uh, this is what I call contact contact value, but it's exactly that. It's the turnaround. It's the chance of hitting a turnaround shot. Yeah. yeah. It's just you know how ready are you? How ready will you be? Because sometimes mm -hmm. nothing important is going to happen for a while. But how how ready do you rate to be? Or does your opponent rate to be by the time something important you know shot leaving comes up? Yeah. And, uh, it's crucial. And I think that's just not. Again, sometimes people think of it, they don't automatically go into, oh, that's my other T in my equation or something. But I think that's really good for people because there are many people who say, oh, my position's great. So yeah, but the other position, if they just hit a shot, it's gin. You know, they automatically mm -hmm. are going to win. So you have to, act. or they think something's a very easy take, but they've got you know a couple of dead men and um, they're just not necessarily appreciating the, the turnaround difficulty. Yeah, it matters so much. This thing about openness, see the whole board don't forget to just uh, or, or don't narrow in on, on some elements on the board see the whole thing yeah see it and appreciate the values of what you're saying uh-huh that's cool okay so you call it pret plus an extra t so pret well i get rid t's. of the p because I, I i you know position can mean anything yeah so hopefully i understand what's going on in the position but it would be really rats yeah <laughs> I, I, I got this one. I call it the value equation, and it's not a mathematical equation. It's just uh, uh, evaluating the the four game plans for each player. So prime, blitz, race, and contact. And contact would be the turnaround shot, whether it's from a back game or holding game, one man back. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, uh, last thing, Will. Um, last question here to round up the the podcast. Will you ever write a backgammon book? Oh, okay. This is actually a category. Of, yeah, it's something I thought about a little. So, so quickly in the in the '90s, I was asked, you know, by several people, would I write a book? Would I collaborate on a book? Whatever. But at the time, I was doing, I was playing backhand for a living, and you know, I could have written something. It was sort of like a throwaway thing, you know, get my name on a cover, make you know, probably not very much money from doing it. Um, 
but not really contribute anything of value or you know share deep insights that I had. And, and it, that wasn't the way I went about things. It was either if I was going to do it, I was really going to share it quite a bit. I actually took some notes for um, like a series. I don't know, it was going to be maybe three books of, of things that I felt like I contributed enough on. Some was redundant. I mean, there have been some decent books already that come, came out. And, Roberti had already come out with volume one or maybe both volumes, and, you know, for instance. But some of what I was going to write about would have been about the psychology of the game, about how, how to learn it efficiently. And um, so not things that were normally being addressed. In any event, I didn't want to give stuff away while I was playing. By the time I retired, I was now, you know, in family mode and working on the sports betting. Pretty much every season had something to offer for me. And as well, the bots were really coming on the scene. The bots, I forget when Jellyfish came out in the 1990s. I, I don't know what year these things were advancing and it's snowy and so on. But I felt like, as well, some of the technical things that I could share would now be not irrelevant, but would have to be updated. Like I would have to actually study with the bots in order to make sure that what I was saying made sense. And you know, I didn't want to write a quiz book that would be like, you know, McGrill would go through with a red pen and say 30% of these things are not true and you know I, I just didn't want to have that happen and, and i was detaching myself more from the game anyhow um by now what i can contribute i'm sort of like in little pieces i feel like i'm sharing uh through these facebook groups um not just you know, give my best idea of an answer to a problem which you know 30 percent of the time i'm just wrong anyhow but but also giving the, the the reasoning and occasionally even going into the psychology of why yeah I think technically this is a take but you know here's here's the reason if you know playing for money or whatever you might double or not double or take or not take based on you know some other and there are other players that do that as well they very frequently plead well it depends who you're playing depends how much better you are than your opponent and of course perfectly valid the way these things are laid out are sometimes very short and not not all that clear. And I feel like sometimes I have the capacity to be clear or at least use descriptions in a way that maybe resonate with people a little bit better on these subjects. So I'm, I'm not necessarily planning to do a book, but you know, maybe if someone over you know five year period gathered up some of my thoughts on Facebook, they could you know come to me and say, I don't know, you said this, are you okay? And I'm like, oh sure, sign <laughs> off on it. Yeah. Okay. Will, it was an absolute pleasure. I hope that all the backgammon players of our community will appreciate this podcast. Do you have any last words? I really, I appreciate being on with you. I, you know, it's, I, I took up the opportunity immediately, not just for my own self gratification, but because my rapport with you has been established, you know, certainly from doing commentary with you in Monte Carlo the last year was a blast and I think went pretty well. So I, I felt comfortable with you then and and now and i think what you're doing with galaxy is tremendous i mean I'm, I'm aware i'm not participating in everything every product that you keep creating or not right now anyhow but i'm, I'm all for it and, and i realize how much energy you put into it and you're doing it's a great thing for the back end community at large thanks a lot will thank you so much okay let's wrap it up thank you thank you guys see you next time bye <laughs>